Thank you for doing this, Patrick. Really appreciate it. I love watching the numbers climbing up. It's nice. Sometimes it's daunting, but I, I've learned I've learned that it doesn't matter how many people there are. Whoever's supposed to be there is is supposed to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Marisa Lafleur, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore. I'm so pleased to introduce this event tonight with Miriam J.A. Chauncey presenting her book, What Storm, What Thunder, in conversation with Patrick Sylvain. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Through virtual events like this one, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community far and wide. Every week we'll be hosting events right here on our Zoom account. And as always, our full event schedule appears on our website at harvard.com events. You can also sign up for our email newsletter there and browse our bookshelves from your home. This event will have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. We'll also conclude this evening's discussion with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase What Storm, What Thunder on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in tonight. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as I'm sure you've experienced in virtual gatherings, Technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly, and we thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's guests. Miriam J. A. Chauncey is a Guggenheim Fellow and HBA Chair of the Humanities at Scripps College. She's the author of What Storm, What Thunder, the featured book tonight, a novel on the 2010 Haiti earthquake published by HarperCollins Canada and Tin House, USA. The Washington Post included it on its list of 15 books to read this fall and described it as a stunning commentary on racism, sexual violence, capitalism, and the resilience required to rebuild a life. And in a starred review, Publishers Weekly writes that each of the voices entrances, thanks to Chauncey's beautiful prose and rich themes, this is not to be missed. Past novels from Miriam include The Loneliness of Angels, winner of the 2011 Guiana Prize in Literature Caribbean Award for Best Fiction 2010, The Scorpion's Claw, and Spirit of Haiti, shortlisted in the Best First Book category, Canada Caribbean Region of the Commonwealth Prize in 2004. She has authored several academic books, including Framing Silence, Revolutionary Novels by Haitian Women. She served as an editorial advisory board member for PMLA from 2010 to 2012, as a humanities advisor for the Fetzer Institute from 2011 to 2013, and as a 2018 advisor for the John S. Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Miriam will be joined in conversation tonight by Patrick Silva, a Haitian American writer, essayist, and poet. He is also an instructor of Haitian language and culture at Brown's University, Brown University Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. We're so happy to have them both here with us tonight. Without further ado, I will turn the digital podium over to you, Miriam and Patrick. Thank you so much for having us, uh, Marissa. Thank you, Harvard Bookstore, for inviting me today and for Patrick uh, for being a willing conversation partner. I'm so happy to have a poet and fellow Haitian American scholar uh, and thinker join me to talk about What Storm, What Thunder. Well, thank you. It's, it's, it's a pleasure um, to be in this forum. And I, I guess, uh, Miriam, I would start first and foremost by asking about the title, uh, mm -hmm. What Storm, What Thunder, um, which sounds as if it could be a question 
but at the same time um, mm -hmm. could be instead of an ex exclamation, static, something that is extremely positive. So the, the title works um, in two ways. Um, what is it really inspire um, the title and how, what can you say about um, the kind of dynamics that, mm -hmm. that exists within the title? Yeah, and thank you very much for asking that question. For, for a very long time, the working title for the novel was actually Duz, you know, the, the name that many Haitians on the ground gave to the earthquake itself, which is the date, January 12th, that it took place in, in 2010. Um, and, and then it, it became the numerical Duz because, you know, Anglophone readers would not read Duz. Uh, and then I became aware that 12 uh, in the popular imagination, especially in the United States, has another resonance that has to do with policing. And I didn't want there to be uh, a mistaken identification. And so then I went through a process with myself, editors, friends, you know, what could be a fitting title for, for this novel. And so first I had the epigraph, which was uh, partly one of uh, three epigraphs. And I, I can read that briefly mm -hmm. from Frederick Douglass's uh, 1852 essay, what to, the what to the Slave is the 4th of July, which I think gets excerpted a lot around that date every year. And he wrote this, of course, several years before Emancipation Proclamation and before Juneteenth. And he wrote, at a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind and the earthquake. And of course, when Douglas wrote this, he was talking about an upheaval that needed to take place in the United States around the enslavement of people of African descent, and that there needed to be this kind of, of shakeup. And in using that epigraph, I was not suggesting or don't mean to suggest that the earthquake was needed in Haiti, not at all, but that the earthquake had this kind of force, this seismic uh, you know, force that upset not only the very ground that people worked on, you know, were walking on, but the, the nature of the society itself. And from the outside, people looking in, you know, it, it should have shaken the relationship to Haiti and to Haitians. And of course, we know that that, that has not been the case. Um, so I wanted to invoke first this idea. And because I'm also a Baldwin scholar, I think in the back of my mind, the Douglas made me think of the fire next, next time. time. And yeah, James Baldwin at the end of that long essay where he's also asking for a change in relationships between you know, white Americans and black Americans, where he says not, the, uh, I think it's, um, not the rainbow sign, the water next time yeah. is, the, is the famous line. And he's uh, invoking a Negro spiritual, which of course comes from a biblical uh, passage. And so when you get to Didier, and Didier is a character uh, in his, uh, I think, I would say late 20s, uh, who is living in Boston. And uh, he's a musician, a folk musician, mm -hmm. but he's hard on his luck, down on his luck in, in Boston. And he is working as a taxi driver, using other people's taxis, you know, to make a bit of a living. Uh, but he's and in that one of those taxis, he finds a Bible uh, and he is reading from that Bible. And you get excerpts from that in his in his section uh, and from Revelation, mm -hmm. then 16, 17, 19 we get a different invocation of the earthquake and the thunderstorm. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since, was not, was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of a nation fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is this sense of a question in the title. You know, what is the meaning of this storm? What is the meaning of this earthquake? And I wanted to play with those different uh, polarities. Right. And again, one of the things that I've, I've noticed, which is really brilliant, is the, the, the kind of intersection um, between history 
Mm -hmm. um, and current event, right? Mm -hmm. um, history as facticity and, and, and history as lived um, experiences. And, and mentioning Douglas who was sort of the first African-American or American counsel in mm -hmm. Haiti. That's it's right. an extremely important role. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I was thinking, and I'm, you know, of, of James Baldwin, of course. Mm -hmm. but I'm also thinking of W.E.B. Du Bois mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well. So, so you have the kind of three giant of mm -hmm. um, American, African-American um, literature and history. Mm -hmm. And DJ, who is living in Boston, um, sort of down and out, trying to mm -hmm. um, remake himself, mm -hmm. um, trying to understand the whole notion of blackness, right? Mm -hmm. What it Absolutely. means, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but also the fact that that um, he's really thinking in terms of immigration as well, right? Mm -hmm. Different forms of immigration, what it means to have an accent, right? Yeah. Um, but also he's encountering not only with people, people who've used them. Mm -hmm. um, like Guy, for example, mm -hmm. um, is encountering with animals, dogs, and which we can mm -hmm. talk about because mm -hmm. there's a, a lot going on th uh, philosophically and right. theologically with just dog, right? That's right. Because the dog becomes his companion, but mm -hmm. he also meets college students. So, mm -hmm. so how did you come to construct mm -hmm. DJ as this not only complex character, mm -hmm. but the character in which I guess the novel, structurally speaking, becomes an extremely important element mm. um, to construct, to fit all the pieces, all the characters in the novel. That's interesting. I, I think in, in various conversations I've had about these characters, because there are 10 main characters in the novel, and the, the book is bookended by Malou, uh, the market woman, so begins and ends with the market woman's voice. Uh, but DJ has a fairly long section. So you're right, there is something that kind of comes to revolve around him. But I think that, that different readers have different favorite characters, you know, and, and whether they think. So, I, I, so I'm always interested as an author uh, how different characters will seem like the center pole for a different readership. But that, that for me means that the work is, is, is doing its work, right? Because I wanted each of those voices to be integral to the entire story. But if you take one away that you don't feel like you have the entire story. I think in Didier, what you get is a, is a kind of crossroads character. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the, the stories that maybe has haunted me as a writer and that I teach a great deal is Marie's Condé crossing the mangrove. Yes. And if uh, people have read that book, there's a character named Zantip, Zantip the Haitian, who seems to be from before time, but he's in time and he's haunting, you know, the, the main character who has just passed away, for whom a wake is being, is being held through the novel. And so I think Didier is a little bit like my Zantip in a sense, but he doesn't know that he's a Zantip. He doesn't know that he's the person who maybe has the keys to something greater. He comes to acknowledge that, right? Because he's also the character who's being visited by Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, one of whom is Haitian. Uh, and he's having to deal a lot with thinking through religious and, as you say, philosophical questions of being. Mm -hmm. And his position as a migrant, as an immigrant within the United States, is also constructed as a kind of it's not just that he's liminal, he gets to see all different aspects of what it means to be Haitian, to be American, to be a black man, to be a young man. And then the interaction with the college students is, is somewhat transactional, right? Because this is also partly how he's making a living. And ironically, it's never really uh, talked about explicitly in the novel because he's having an affair at one point with a young woman, just as the earthquake is about to happen, who's from Bangladesh. Uh, but it's it's I've written it in such a way that the reader sh should intuit that he has the habit of letting himself be picked up, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's making money, he's getting different things from those young women. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, so there's a way in which he's constructed as someone who has access to a great deal, but he also needs a great deal. But in the end, he'll be able to understand a great deal more about what it means to e exist in these two societies at the same time and belong to neither. Right. Would you like to read a, a section from, from DJ and then and yeah. have some more questions about, about DJ? Let me see. I'm going to try. I'm going to read. Um, so this is this is his encounter with the, the, the young woman, the co-ed, you know, that he meets uh, in Cambridge Square. Uh, he says, it was like we were old friends. This is on page 213, if anyone has the book. It was like we were old friends, but we'd never met before. 
It was like something in me felt I could trust her because she was from a place like mine. She was quiet, not asking me for anything. I ate like I hadn't eaten in two days. It's possible I hadn't. Sometimes I lose track of time, especially when the nights are long and the ride scares. You have to stay awake somehow, wait and wait and wait. It's easy to lose track of things like food. I drink a lot of coffee when I take breaks and wait for the Cambridge girls. Not exactly nutrition. Empty calories, sport, diversion. She gave me seconds without asking. I turned the sound down on the TV. They weren't showing us anything important. Why aren't they showing us anything important? I asked to no one in particular, gesticulating at the television with one hand, holding the second serving of food in the other. With all the technology they have, can't they show us anything more than these graphs and things? What the, I felt like throwing the plate across the room, smashing it to pieces, but I knew I wasn't in my own place and my mother had taught me better than that. But I did feel like breaking something. The girl studied me. Maybe we should get online, she offered. Sometimes the news online is better, more up to date. I nodded, yes, I said that would be good. She smiled for the third time that night. She moved some hair out of her eyes. Just let me put these in the sink. But she did more than that. She rinsed everything we had used and put the dishes in the dishwasher, then put away the tubs of leftovers back into the fridge. Come on, she said finally, not unkindly, as if she'd realized that I was like a wounded animal that could be provoked to unpredictable behavior. Come on, she said again, and led me back into her room. Bring a chair with you, she added. I grabbed a chair from the living room. No, she said, without even looking at me. Get one of those in the kitchen, they're smaller. The other one won't fit in my room. I found a chair in the kitchen, one of those cheap plywood things that made me that, that's made to look chic, but is simply a copy of something more expensive. And then I followed her into her room with it. She'd already put on her computer and found a live stream of the earthquake. The live stream was Canadian. You understand French, she asked. Yes, I said, putting down the chair next to her. Thought so, she said, turning up the volume and got up to close the bedroom door. My roommate will be getting back any time. No point in alarming him. I moved over so that I was in front of the screen. They were about to show images directly from the Capitol. All they had were still shots taken in the dark from satellite feeds. The National Palace, the Palais National, fallen, broken in two. That can't be real, I said. The girl peered over my shoulder. I smelled spice and lilac, not an entirely unpleasant scent. I don't know, she said. I felt hot breath on my neck. Looks real. Photoshop, I said. They can make anything seem real. That can't be real. The announcer's voice was shrill. We're trying to get as much information as we can, he said in French. Built by the United States in 1920, the National Palace of Haiti has fallen like a deck of cards. Kumama, I said. In my mind, I was thinking Armageddon, the end of the world, apocalypse. I wish that the Jehovah Witnesses were there to talk to. So, you know, what's really fascinating to me um, in sort of this passage you just read, it's really um, two and a half pages, right? But within two and a half pages, you have the notions of the wounded, not mm -hmm. only the wounded animal, but the wounded being. Mm -hmm. of, you have the notion of pure modernity or even post-modernity, right? The, the, the notions of live streaming, <laughs> right? Um, versus the old TV, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but you also have history, history yes. of the invasion of the, of the United States and, That's and, right. and what the United States did. So mm -hmm. in a sense, you, there, there are a lot of, of, of information there, but mm -hmm. it's done in a way where humanity, the, the, the quality of the human, right? Mm -hmm. um, the susceptibility Mm -hmm. um, of Didier as being a kind of wounded person alone, mm -hmm. uh, right. but yet remembering his mother, minding his manners, right? Mm -hmm. And the woman being very cautious and aware mm -hmm. of how things could turn uh, and reading him almost like a psychologist because mm -hmm. she too is wounded. So That's how right. do you manage to get so much? <laughs> <laughs> In I don't know. Space. <laughs> I think this is the magic of, of writing and intuiting, but also it's uh, a lot of work in terms of a revision process and trying to peel away anything that's not necessary so that the reader is left with those pieces of information that are clear, right? That are clear, that are succinct, um, but that still carry that sense of humanity, you know, in terms of a, of a, of a character that's true to the character. Uh, but I also, you know, spent a lot of time 
uh, double checking my facts, making sure that my facts were correct, uh, making sure that, you know, trying to find out, you know, trying to remember, first of all, for myself, having been on the outside, you know, being somebody like Didier who saw those images, those first images coming out of Port-au-Prince, you know, really trying to think about, well, what did the announcers say? You know, did they recall that history or not? Uh, but sometimes, you know, taking some liberties and as the author interjecting some of that information in places where it would be in, unintrusive, but would provide a kind of basis for understanding the characters' reactions to what was happening. So you have now a, a memory of a US occupation. He doesn't say, well, we were occupied at this time, but the fact that the, the information is given, the US built the National Palace, you have to start thinking, well, then why is that important? You know, wh why would this fact be important? Why would he be so struck by its falling? Because it, by this time, by 2010, the National Palace had become a national symbol mm -hmm. and uh, of pride even. And sometimes even we forget, you know, as Haitians, that it was built under the U.S. occupation, although it was designed by a Haitian, which comes up in a different chapter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so staying with the relationship between the Bangladeshi woman and mm -hmm. Didier, um, there's a passage in which it, it's so seamless, um, mm -hmm. or perhaps seems ac accidental or coincidental that he meets. Um, a woman in, in Harvard Square or mm -hmm. in Cambridge, uh, mm -hmm. and then she happens to be from Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there is, there is a kind of language um, in there as well. The, the language that she speaks in her own, mm -hmm. in her own tongue in, in Bengali, mm -hmm. um, but also but the kind of, she, she understands him, but he also understands her without mm -hmm. asking for translation. Is it right. possible to, to read the section. Um, uh, do you want to point me to that particular page? I didn't have it um, um, marked for today, but I can. Oh, okay, it. so so it's it's um, sorry, it's the section on on page two eighteen. Two eighteen. Um, two eighteen. Um, where Just the paragraph at the bottom of two eighteen. Yeah. Long yeah, paragraph. The long, that long paragraph. I think starting with "You feel good," she said. Um, okay. If, if, if I'll, that I'll is try okay. it. I'll try it. <laughs> because I, my, I only know or knew a little bit of, of Bengali, so I, I may mispronounce. So anyone who knows Bengali, please forgive me. Okay. Um, so you feel good, she said. She emptied words into my ear that I had heard before, before and others that were alien, translating them as she went. When I did things she liked, she said, balo. When she became excited, she said, kub balo. When I became too eager, she said, Ashte. And I knew from her movements that she wanted me to slow down. But after a few minutes of this dance between strangers with pleasure mixed with guilt assailing my every cell, after she guided me into her small frame and I grasped her torso, I forgot everything but what I had seen on the computer screen and emptied myself into her in desperation. My eyes closed tight. I saw white fluorescence, felt ecstatic release, a serpentine uncoiling. When I was spent, I remembered where I was. I asked her if she was all right. Ami baluaki, she said, just fine. She pushed me away and leapt out of the bed. I heard the shower running. I had started falling asleep when a thought jolted me awake. I hadn't used a condom. I didn't know the girl. She could have anything, be anyone. I could have made a child with her. I didn't know. So to me, when I'm reading this passage, right, because it's it's in the context of Amagedon, right? It's mm -hmm. it's in the context the of of um, I was thinking of what happens during the Roman Empire mm. um, when soldiers mm. um, were sort of given um, um, relationship to with, with prostitutes, mm -hmm. um, so that they would, in, in a sense, prevent PTSD, although the, the word PTSD did, didn't exist. Mm. So to me, as I'm reading it, um, and I'm thinking that, you know, she's from Bangladesh. Um, she's obviously seen um, things that were uh, devastating. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. She's wounded and mm -hmm. he's wounded, but yet through, if we can call it lovemaking, Mm -hmm. it, time uh, disappears or per perhaps right. the wound completely mm -hmm. disappears right mm -hmm. but yet later on we find out that the bangladesh or bangladesh mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it was really involved in Haiti. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's not just a coincidence, right? Right. right. <laughs> so, uh, how do you sort of negotiate, right, that 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 personal um, aspect of meeting? And, uh, yes. Yeah, and it, it it is and it isn't because I'm because I think my thinking in having different characters crossing paths, you know, in this novel was a sense that, you know, this, this is the reality of being in the Americas. You know, we encounter people from all around the world and we actually have similar stories, you know? Um, and so there was a way in which I was trying to thread the experience of the earthquake into the fabric of a larger global conversation and how these conversations intersect, you know? So, you know, if you're thinking about something like the Roman empire, then we can think about the fall of the American empire, which, yeah. you know, I remember there was a Canadian film that, that it was called, I think the end of the American empire, which was announced, I think in the late eighties and it still hasn't happened. Right. Um, but there is a sense in which we, we have this, this, this sense of foreboding that this empire is getting too large too muscular and something is going to give. Well, we see, ha see that happening with all of the issues with immigration and migrants. And we saw it you know, with the 14,000 Haitian migrants who came you know, up from Chile and Brazil uh, to the Mexican US border. And we saw it in the several years after the earthquake when all of that money went into Haiti and there was no real result for people, for the you know, average Haitian in terms of, of where those funds went. And so in the encounter with, with Didier and, and the young woman, I was trying to get at the ways in which we do encounter one another, you know, immigrants encounter one another and sometimes have similar stories. But, and, and at this moment that I just read, there seems to be a real meeting of, of the spirits, right? So it's not just a sexual encounter, there's something bigger happening. There's a kind of healing that is happening. And then as he returns to the material world, he also feels, you know, a sense of uh, of shame, irresponsibility. What was he doing? You know, um, was he using the girl rather than being used by her, which is, you know, his usual dynamic. Um, but then he has comfort in this in this interaction because he spends all of the early days after the earthquake with this young woman, only to then realize once that they start, you know, falling into a kind of coupling mm -hmm. that she, her mind is not in. The, the, the space, he thinks that they have found something together, that they're sharing their sort of third world expatriate existence. And she's, her response to cat catastrophe, which is related to, you know, uh, Bangladesh, is that she has seen this all before, so she doesn't think this should be any different. At the same time, she wants to inform him that Bangladesh is sending women uh, you know, UN soldiers into Haiti, right. which which did happen, right? Um, and it happened at a time when a lot of uh, uh, women were suffering insecurity in the camps. And it and it actually the reality of it is that it made no difference right. because right. of what the UN was actually tasked to do in right. Haiti. And right. so I think through that character, I wanted to comment on larger global mm -hmm. politics and how the, the you know the facile you know thinking that just coming together on a on a point of, of uh, marginalization on the global scale might not actually play out in a way that might that would be as healing as he had first thought. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's also a play here uh, in that passage because his sister, who is Tafia, who will uh, end up in an internally displaced camp, so a refugee within her own nation, will suffer uh, sexual violence that is unwanted. And she will, uh, you know, uh, have to live with the consequences of some of, of, of male violence, right. and she will have a child from bad violence. Um, DJ will not, but his sister will go through a, another version of this and an encounter with somebody who should have had compassion with, for her, mm -hmm. but did not. Okay. So is, is it possible to, to read, um, I guess, because I, for me, I see that both Tafia um, and her name is simply fascinating as well. Uh, both Tafia and Didi are very philosophical, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is a kind of connection between the two of them, mm -hmm. not only because they're brothers and sisters, but the, the way in which they think and the way in which um, I guess they were both wounded and, 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 and encountered different forms of violence. And of course, um, the violence in the camp um, mm -hmm. that, that Tafia experience is was extremely dehumanizing um, mm -hmm. as well but part of the the text right uh, the book 
the notions of birth and rebirth and death, mm-hmm. right? Through mm-hmm. the symbols of the eggs and, and so forth, and bones and so forth. So c- could you please read a passage um, from that section, from Tafia? Tafia? Yeah. Um, you might have to suggest uh, what I, I was hope I was going to read a little bit about her experience in the camp, but I'm happy oh, go to ahead, please, please, from absolutely. anywhere else. No, absolutely. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is just her her describing what it's like to be in the camp. So Tafia has lost her family home. Uh, they've lost their aunt um, and they have very few belongings and they retreat into uh, one of the IDP camps. So this is how she explains what, what their life was like there. Um, Sunday, we sorted the wash for Monday and put our few things in order by our beds on stools or little stands if we had managed to find or make some. This is on page 139. Then the women went to mass, either to the churches in their old neighborhoods, if they were still standing, or right there in the camp if there was a priest or pastor or even a gong, a healer willing to hold a service. If they went back to their neighborhoods, it could be a long journey but they were also glad because they were getting out of the squalor of a tent city for a while, even if it was back to the areas where there was nothing left to look at. Those were days for dreaming and hoping and giving thanks for what was left, if you had it in you. The remainder of Sunday was for rest and drawing up plans for the next week. Other tent cities probably worked differently and within them, there must have been variations, but I trusted the elderly women because they had lived long enough to have gray on their heads. To me, this was an achievement as significant as getting a high school diploma or as Didier had done, having the faith to move to another country to start over. Getting old couldn't be a matter of of simple luck. I walked through the camp, watching as each person acted out their rituals of a day against all the despair and fear they felt. The smallest of the children were playing together. Old men traded dominoes, on boards laid across their knees. There was nothing else to do but keep an eye on one's dry corner of the world to sleep in before having to start the search for food, water, loved ones. It was hard to believe that only a few weeks before, all I had been thinking about was school matters, going to the clubs and whether I would have friends or a date for a school dance. It was hard to believe that my life and that of my family was reduced to a small tent no belongings except the blue box, which is a a little iPod DJ center and waiting. It was hard to believe that only a few weeks ago, all I had cared about were things like my name and soap opera storylines and getting invited out by popular girls. And that now we were in a telenovela ourselves, hoping to awaken from a dream. Most of the time, all there was to do was think about the life we used to have, the life we used to want to escape, which now I realize was so much better than what we had been reduced to waiting in the camp. Mm-hmm. That, to me, it's, <sighs> thank you, thank you. I, I, it, it's the characters um, are extremely very powerful, um, studying that particular section in terms of telenovelas, right? Yes. Which is a kind of escape, mm-hmm. um, leaving the physical precarity to imagine in, in somewhere else, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and the somewhere else is always better. And even the poverty in the telenovelas are not comparable to the poverty in which they are experiencing. That's right. Um, and, and also, but the kind of violence that, that Tafia experienced from Junior, mm-hmm. right? Um, a, a kind of person who became this kind of a bad boy. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, within that passage, you have her brother, Paul, who is also thinking of a different kind of violence or wishing to be someone else, mm-hmm. a cowboy and a Tonton Maku. So mm-hmm. you have a, a lot mm-hmm. um, happening in, in that section. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so how then do you sort of negotiate uh, maintaining Tafia's beauty mm-hmm. and that is both external and internal mm-hmm. um, with the ugliness, the precarity mm-hmm. um, that that surrounds her. Yeah, I think I think the you know what I wanted to do as a writer with Tafia was in fact to give the reader that sense of a great beauty that someone like her and many people like her carry. 
you know, despite the circumstances, you know, and so because you have, there are three family groups in the novel, and Tafia is in one of those family groups, and Didier, we've already heard about, and then Sonia, her older sister, who is a sex worker, she's a, a half sister, um, and there's also Paul, and you only get, uh, as you mentioned, uh, sort of glimpses of Paul through the other characters, and Paul is, is very ambiguous. Um, and he is someone who would not have known the Duvalier regime, doesn't understand it, you know, has seen pictures and he thinks, well, these are very glamorous people and this is what he should be. This is what, you know, Haiti should have in the future. And so part of what I tried to do with Tafia was to show how that future that he's dreaming about is actually already present, that there's already this kind of subterranean holdover from the time of a regime in terms of gender violence, in terms of, you know, a kind of an instability, especially for women, that then Tapia experiences directly through Junior, who's a young man who couldn't take no for an answer when she, you know, before the earthquake, and then the earthquake gives him, in fact, a kind of permission uh, to, to unleash, you know, this, this violence, this ugliness mm -hmm. on her. But Despite this violence, Tafia, like many of the women and you know, young people who experience violence in the IDP, IDP camps, they had to continue, they had to persist. Many young women had children after uh, violence in the camps and they had to uh, continue. I don't, I don't think that that was the case for everyone, right? But that the ability to continue, I don't think it was easy for anyone, but I wanted to capture this sense of trauma upon trauma, but still, doesn't necessarily take away the beauty of the individual. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when we leave Tafia, who's only 16, you know, by the, by the end of the novel, she's only a year older. Um, we have a sense that when Didier returns, because through her, we find out Didier will return, but that's not shown in the novel, we'll, that she will be the one teaching, the, teaching not only her child, but Didier what it was like to live through this time and, what the, and the kind of fortitude that it takes to persist. Mm. Um, so, I, so I think that's lovely if, if you and, and other readers have the sense that um, her beauty is not taken away uh, from in terms of that violence. And yeah. I, I also wanted to mention that the, the um, soap opera that she's watching at the beginning of her section is a real soap opera um, that was very popular in Haiti at the time. And it actually is one of the reasons a number of people perished in their homes because they were home at that time to watch this particular telenovela. And so when I re researched the telenovela, I was really shocked to see that it had all these parallels with Haitian life, uh, which is why I, I captured that, that sense of, of, of why you know, a teenager would be watching it with such glee and trying to figure out if, if uh, those things that happened in the telenovela would happen to her. Yeah. Um, right. yeah. Yeah. And this is, I mean, we could go on for a while. I think looking at the time, it, pretty soon we're going to have um, question and answer session Q&A. Sure. But so the last question I'll, I'll ask before I turn it over, um, as a scholar, as a literary critic, um, how do you uh, sort different of hats. <laughs> the different hats negotiate shutting off right, the literary mm -hmm. critic to allow the writer mm -hmm. room to thrive? And then when do you bring in the literary critic, the scholar, uh, to say to the writer, okay, um, <laughs> let, us, let us be a little bit more philosophical. Let us be a uh, little, little more. Because <laughs> um, I, you know, the Richard section, right? Uh, yes. Of notions of water, which brings mm -hmm. back, and even notions of eggs and bones and mm -hmm. how Vodun mm -hmm. is, is, is thread throughout mm -hmm. the arc of the book. Um, yeah. And the relationship with, with the Jehovah Witness and Haiti being represented as hell, for example. Mm -hmm. So how do you negotiate uh, sort of... <laughs> in, a, in a way, you kind of answered the question, or at least you've intuited it, because I think uh, it's really, you know, the spiritual side tells the intellectual side to shut itself off. That, that's, that's my creative process. Um, you know, because I came to writing this novel three years after giving, you know, series of talks on the post-earthquake situ uh, situation and doing a lot of work in and out of Haiti. And when I started working on the novel it was after I had an encounter with a, a Trinidadian painter who was, you know, sort of uh, transferring 
you know, whatever information he was receiving on a spiritual plane to his mm -hmm. paintings. And then I realized that I had something like that happening with me. And all of the novels, be, all of the characters for this novel came forth within a, a week. And then of course it took wow. me many years, you know, to develop the characters, but they all came at once very clearly, this is who we are. Oh, wow. This is, you know, this is what we want to say. Mm -hmm. And then I had to learn, you know, what their voices were, how they wanted to tell their story, where they, you know, what part of their story they wanted to tell. Did they want to talk about the before the earthquake, the during the earthquake, the after? And that's how, you know, I developed the voices. And I didn't write this chronologically. I wrote it uh, by voice, you know, which voice came forth. That's who I wrote, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and of course, it was informed by all of the information I had uh, accumulated over those three years uh, of doing work in Haiti, talking about Haiti, talking to survivors. Um, and so I, I knew I knew so much, but it was easy to interject, you know, facts into their storylines. And then it was only when I was in the revising process that then I had to really check, you know, is, is this the church I'm talking about? Is this the correct name of this church? Or in the case of Jonas, an 11 year old boy who uh, has a crushed limb due to the earthquake, you know, I had to uh, research the effects of gangrene, you know, and, and what happens because there were lots of reports at the time of people who suffered cigar cut, uh, you know, amputations. And, and, and who would die of gangrene. We never heard what happened to those individuals. Mm -hmm. So I did the, re the medical research. What does happen to people who have these kinds of amputations and don't have the proper medical care? Mm -hmm. um, so, so it was kind of, you know, the initial writing, you know, the bulk of the writing had to be, you know, Miriam, uh, you know, the intuitive, more vodou spiritualist, and I'm wearing my Matenwa <laughs> spiritual scarf today, uh, you know, and just go with, with what you hear and what you feel and, and get out of your own way and then come back and make sure that the details connect and are succinct and, and are well-researched. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you are right, but I do infuse a lot of philosophy and a lot of theology in a certain sense in the work and it was important for me to thread in uh, voodoo as a, as a life force, as a healing force, especially given that so much of the way Haiti is spoken about is disparaging with respect to spiritual beliefs. And so I tapped into those spiritual beliefs in order to write the novel. And I think um, that that runs from the first epigraph, which opens the, the, the novel to the very end when uh, the women gather in Sodo. Right, right. Um, I Perhaps, um, can we go to um, q and because otherwise I could keep asking questions <laughs> um, if, if there are no questions. There are. Uh, okay, great. Thank you so much for the talk so far. It's been excellent. Um, so the first question, the attendee is, is an anonymous attendee who says, thank you for this talk. I look forward to reading this book. You've acknowledged the various threads, historical, personal, formal, that make up this complex novel. When you first began writing, was there a theme or a character or even an image that first formed the seed of the story? Yeah, thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Um, the first thing was how many characters should reflect the experience of the earthquake. And I started with, with 12 who are still there, but you have 10 main voices. Um, and, but the seed was Jonas, who's a character who, you, who you'll see appear throughout the novel, but then has his own section later in the novel. So there's the 11 year old boy uh, who becomes an amputee and um, I won't give away what happens to him, but um, he was the, the, the life force, I think of the novel. And also Malou. So th there was Jonas first and then there was Malou, the market woman uh, who really listens to everyone and understands everyone from the point of view of the marketplace and interactions in the marketplace. Thank you. Um, Priscilla says, uh, good evening. Thank you for this conversation. It was very inspiring and beautiful. I wonder what was the first character you wrote and who, uh, how it came to you? Uh, that's the same, the same answer. It would be Jonas. It would be Jonas, little boy. And if, if I may ask, uh, it, it was the relationship between Jonas and Jonah, the biblical character. Yeah, Jonah, Jonah who's swallowed by the whale. And I, I didn't find a lot that I could play with, with the biblical tale, but there, that is one of her, yeah, he is named uh, after that, after that uh, biblical character. So since we're speaking about characters, um, one question asker asks, with such a colorful and varying cast of characters, 
When you were writing, did you ever find that your character's choices surprised you? Oh, absolutely. Um, and this is it goes back to Patrick's question about, you know, where do you shut off the, you know, the, the scholar and where does the creative writer come in? Um, because I think for me, the writing of, of a novel really is about getting out of your, getting out of a character's way, if I can put it a, a different way. And so with some of the characters, a good example would be Richard. Again, I won't give away what happens to him, but Richard is a, a CEO of a water bottling company in France. He's also Malou's uh, son. Something he doesn't acknowledge is that he's learned to be an entrepreneur and a very good businessman from his mother because he's ashamed of his past. And, um, and so what, how he changes over the course of his return to Haiti and what ultimately happens to him was, was very surprising. Um, so that I think a number of the characters made choices that I didn't quite expect, but made sense once I was very consistent with who they were. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Maurice Condi's novel at the beginning of the talk. The symphonic quality of your novel also reminds me of Dion Brand, a writer who was always using the chords of many voices in poetry and in her fiction to convey at least part of what it is like to be a woman of many countries, tongues, lineages. In crafting your own symphony, did you feel similarly that many lives needed to be voiced in order to get to the heart of the storm and its aftermath? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so as a scholar, I'm, I'm a scholar of Caribbean women's literature and uh, Caribbean women's literature and Caribbean literature in general is polyphonic uh, traditionally. It's very rare, but you don't find a novel that's many voice. Um, Dion Brand is a good example, Marie Condé, uh, you know, the poetry of Marlene Dombezi Philip, uh, you know, for Haiti, Edwige Danzica, and, of course, and I would encourage people to read uh, newly translated works by Yannick Laens and Emilie Prophet, who are uh, more recent women writers who are starting to get their work published in, in English. Um, and, and the reason I chose that aside from the tradition was also because I was haunted myself by the numbers of people who died in the earthquake, 250 to 300,000 people whose names will never entirely be known except to their immediate families if they had surviving family. And so in a very small way, I wanted those 12 voices and you know, the 10 voices you have in the end in the novel uh, to stand in for those individuals who would never have a name to somehow represent all of those individuals. I know we can't do that, but I, I wanted to, in individualizing the plight of of survivors and also those who departed, I wanted to somehow put a face to those individuals and have a more intimate experience of the earthquake for the, for the reader. Great. Um, so when talking about the research you did into what happened, you acknowledged so many gaps in the response and its failures, but also in the subsequent coverage. Did you find the way that the mainstream Western news covered the earthquake to be hard to access or discouraging or both? Um, well, that's a complicated question. Um, I mean, I think I was called upon to give all those talks because there were so many gaps and there was a lot of frustration, uh, you know, whether it was at the college level or people working in, you know, human rights issues. Um, there was a, a need, an intense need for conversation about better practices on the ground, uh, you know, uh, what outlets people could reach out to if they were going to donate. Uh, but just a conversation even among ourselves, you know, people who were intimately related to Haiti about how do we carry the work forward on behalf of people in Haiti and also outside in a way that is resonant with what people on the ground really want for themselves. And so I think there were a lot of gaps, you know, the, the, and this happens with any large catastrophe anywhere, anywhere in the world where we see this happening right now uh, in various parts of the world. You know where the news goes in, you know, gets the sound bites, gets you know the immediate uh, images, and then the people are forgotten. And only those of us who are related to those areas then are you know can do some of the work to to move things forward in a, in a intelligible way. I think one of the things that sometimes people don't think about is that the conversation around the earthquake wasn't just about uh, you know talking about the, the, the catastrophic elements of it or the, the shock elements of it, um, and certainly the, the shock doctrine element after 2010 in terms of what went wrong with rebuilding and aid, there was also, to me, a disturbing conversation about the resiliency of 
uh, of Haitians. I remember a lot of uh, news reports on alternative media, um, you know, trying to put a good face on the aftermath of the earthquake. And, you know, so what I tried to do in this novel was to move away from the term resiliency to maybe more a term that maybe more is, I think is more apt, which is persistence, you know, how people persist um, when these things are happening, but that they are not made for this, you know, no one is made for catastrophe, no one is made, uh, you know, for a certain kinds of calamities. And, I, and that's where I wanted to really humanize uh, the experience of the earthquake so that people could move away from this language of resiliency towards a language of humanity and a persistence in, in the midst of calamity that should not actually be happening. You know, we should not be uh, demanding or expecting that certain people in certain places in the world rise to the occasion to deal with things that no one should be asked to deal with. So I'm hoping that this is what the novel can do and, um, and maybe that it can spark conversations about you know, what it's like to live through some of these kinds of circumstances and maybe change the response to them. But I'm also, I'm also hoping, and I've heard from some people that it has done this for them, even if they're not Haitian. So if they are Haitian, but also sometimes if they're not Haitian, but it, but it can serve as a kind of healing space, a kind of resting place, um, you know, that it can reflect some of what some, you know, whether we were outside, like people like DDAs or like Anne's, you know, the architect in the novel, um, that it reflects something of our experience of what it, it has been like these last 10, 11 years, and certainly uh, since August 14th, what it has been like for another group of people going through another earthquake in Haiti. Thank you. And we, it looks like we have one last question. Um, is there a spe specific reason why DDA is in Boston? There actually is. So I'm happy that somebody asked that question. And it actually is related to earlier questions about research. And so I have written some prior novels, um, most of which are published, at, but all of which were published out of the UK. Uh, and so in those books, the terrain was slightly different. So always Haiti and then, you know, another locale might have been Paris or uh, some part of Canada because I was raised in Quebec City uh, and Winnipeg. And so I've used like Quebec as a background in the last novel for, for a couple of the characters. Um, and so when I turned to this novel, I, I wanted there to be an American component. Um, and I thought, well, I could look to Miami. I could look to New York. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. Uh, I wrote most of this novel living in Cincinnati and also in, in Winnipeg, Canada. Um, and I thought actually there's a Boston connection and uh, I know it through people like uh, Patrick and I know it uh, through some other uh, colleagues and friends of mine who, and I also lived in Massachusetts for a while. Um, and so I knew that there was a Haitian American population in Boston and I did some, some research on that. And um, you know, learned about Matapan and that whole area where there are a lot of uh, Haitian uh, immigrants. And I also learned about the churches in that area, which is why uh, DDA has this sort of expansive religious experience. Uh, so that's why Boston, and it also uh, maybe less less uh, fortunately, I also wanted to think about um, the racism and the divisions that still exist in in Boston. And so it was an ideal place to place a Haitian who would have community there, but then would also have to confront uh, a racism that he's unfamiliar with coming from Haiti. Not that there aren't uh, divisions according to class and color in Haiti, there are, but there isn't the kind of American racism uh, that, he, that he experiences. Mm -hmm. So it was I mean, a confluence of many things. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I, what I also love is the fact that, you know, he is, DJ, he's given books, right, by the college students. Yes. He's list he, he listens to NPR, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so that because he he wants to increase his vocabulary, and he also wishes to get rid of his accents. And, and I'm thinking of myself when, as an immigrant, you know, listen to NPR. <laughs> NPR is always on and at home, yeah, uh, and 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 so forth. And so I think I think, and also the 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 research in terms of the landscape, Alston. Mm -hmm. um, where it's just from Mattapan, Cambridge, also, it's really, really uh, well done and well researched. And I really sort of appreciate that. I guess the last thing, because, because of time, mm -hmm. anything you wanted to say about 
bones and eggs <laughs> and, and water. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But, um, well, I want to thank you, Patrick, for all these questions. I want to thank the audience too for coming and all, all of your questions and uh, Harvard Bookstore for hosting us. It's just been wonderful. Um, yeah, the, the novel begins with bones uh, and ends with bones. Uh, a memory of bones and so and and the fragility of eggs because the little boy Jonas is uh, buying an egg when when the calamity hits and uh, is from a family where they can never buy a dozen eggs at the same time. Um, so I wanted to sort of capture in very material terms, you know what it's like to be living in a world where there is that precarity at, in every moment, but a precarity that that could not be. Uh, foreseen to have the scale that it would have on January 12, 2010. I think that's the, the fastest way I can wrap it up in the time that we have. <laughs> this is, that's great. Thank you so much. Oh, thank a, you. A wonderful, a wonderful book. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, thank you for this wonderful talk. Thank you to everyone in the audience for spending your evening with us. Um, you can learn more about this incredible book and purchase What Storm, What Thunder at the link that I posted in the chat. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'd just like to say, have a good night, keep reading, and please be well. Thank you so much. Take care, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.